change of subject here. Um, these are my disclosures. So I was given this uh, title to, to consider, and my immediate thought was, in acute valvular regurgitation, we have very sick patients who are often shocked and in pulmonary edema. Surely there's no place to be taking them for multimodality imaging. But on reflection, I think I'm entirely wrong. We use multimodality imaging all the time in these patients. This is uh, an example of a patient with pulmonary edema treated um, as um, pneumonia for some period of time, had had previous mitral valve surgery, and using simple M mode, we see no normalization of the septal motion and very high transmitral velocities. And we're very used to using different types of TOE to interrogate valves in the case of paraprosthetic regurgitation. So actually, multimodality imaging is routine for us. So my talk is going to be a little longer than it would have been on initial reflection. And I'm going to talk a little about um, acute valvular regurgitation within the clinical context to explain some of the challenges that face us, particularly on the uh, CICU and the ICU. And I'm going to uh, focus on acute mitral and acute aortic regurgitation because these are the lesions that make the patient sick. And I have three key messages, really. Firstly, that these patients are really sick. And if you don't deal with acute uh, severe regurgitation rapidly, it's potentially rapidly lethal. The second is that we do use multimodality imaging routinely, but some of the newer techniques are not yet well validated, particularly in the acutely unwell patient. And one must always bear in mind that inappropriate delay or and inappropriate transfer for investigations is always bad for this kind of patient. So first, this, I'd recommend this excellent review looking at management of acute regurgitation in left-sided cardiac valves from the, De the Texas Heart Institute. And they give some very nice um, guidance on how to approach these patients. The first is, even if the patient is catastrophically sick, the decision-making can be quite complex, and there is a requirement for expeditious multidisciplinary care. On occasion, but not always, it is a true surgical emergency, and one does have time to make the diagnosis, but it can be challenging. You need clinical acumen, you need appropriate investigations, and you need to have very sound clinical judgment. These patients uh, may present in a non-specific way. The clinical findings may be subtle and or atypical. And here's an example for the clinical findings in patients with uh, acute severe mitral regurgitation. Firstly, they may or may not have a low cardiac output um, and cardiogenic shock, um, with or without pulmonary edema, which may be on some occasions unilateral and mistaken for a pneumonia. They may not have a tachycardia if they are beta blocked. They may not have a displaced LV apex if this is very severe acute mitral regurgitation. And if it occurs in the context of a myocardial infarct, they may not have the hyperdynamic left ventricle. When mitral regurgitation is really catastrophic, the murmur may be absent. Uh, the loud P2 is absent in about 25% of cases. If you float a, a pulmonary artery catheter and you look for V waves acutely, they're absent in about a third of patients. And the right side of filling pressures are absent, being elevated or absent in over 82% of patients. So our clinical um, assessment can be challenging. They then, in this paper, go on to talk about how challenging it is in terms of determining the treatment. There are no randomized control trials for these patient populations. There are several case series in either one uh, center or multiple centers, and these are generally not protocol-driven. However, there is sufficient data in the literature to allow us to um, uh, describe some overarching principles, and these have been translated into practice guidelines from the ESC jointly with the EACS, and also the ACC and the AHA. When one looks at the causes of severe acute regurgitation, these are all diseases that you really wouldn't want to have. So in terms of uh, aortic regurgitation, type A dissection and endocarditis are the two commonest. And for mitral regurgitation, caudal or papillary muscle rupture is the commonest. And in both groups, there are uh, features of or potential to have prosthetic valve dysfunction and iatrogenic injury. So these all need to be considered. And the mainstay of diagnosis absolutely is echocardiography. There are some features that would suggest severe acute uh, regurgitation, both in aortic regurgitation and mitral regurgitation. The most sinister of these is premature mitral valve closure in severe aortic regurgitation. That suggests your patient is at very high risk of dying within the next 24 hours, if not operated. The next challenge is also the context of critical care um, 
and what we do to our patients. So all the things that the intensivists do to try and get the patient out of pulmonary edema and support the circulation can profoundly affect what you see on echocardiography. And what is normal within the critical care setting is generally not known, and most of these patients have been eliminated from randomized controlled trials. So you're very much on the back foot when you're imaging these patients. And in particular, I'd like to highlight mechanical circulatory support, which is uh, seeing a renaissance across uh, particularly uh, Europe, but also the whole of the world. Firstly, it's quite difficult to identify regurgitation when the heart's not contracting. So at the top, we have a patient who is on veno-arterial ECMO, following a TAVI insertion. Um, if you put color over that mitral valve, there's absolutely no color flow at all because the pressure in the left atrium is the same as the pressure in the left ventricle. So it is difficult to use standard echocardiographic parameters. Secondly, in the lower um, tracing, this is a patient again on uh, VA ECMO. This is central VA ECMO. So we're delivering five liters continuously of blood into the ascending aorta. And this patient has what would normally be considered as not very severe aortic regurgitation. But because of several days of extracorporeal support the, and continuous AR, so it's not just in diastole, it's systole and diastole, you have to reevaluate how you would assess the degree of severity of AR in these patients. Anyway, moving on first to mitral regurgitation. Uh, from our ESC guidelines, we're urged to consider severe acute mitral regurgitation in a patient presenting acutely with cardiogenic shock in the presence of an active left ventricle and a characteristic uh, CW uh, Doppler waveform, which you can see on the bottom right. Um, it also, you may remember from the causes, may be caused by endocarditis and trauma, but the common, commonest is within the context of um, LV disease related to coronary disease. And our job then as echocardiographers are to de delineate and demonstrate the pathology for the surgeons. So uh, on the left you have a papillary muscle rupture and on the right you have acute caudal muscle rupture. And both of these patients presented in cardiogenic shock. So the role of echocardiography is, is fairly uh, evident and well researched. You may find that when your patient is intubated and ventilated following presentation in cardiogenic shock and with pulmonary edema, that they no longer have mitral regurgitation. And in this case, even on the ICU and even in the presence of inotropic support, you may reach for your stress echo. So on the top left, you have a patient who was in pulmonary edema, cardiogenic shock, who was intubated and ventilated and underwent a transesophageal echo. At the time of the TOE, their systolic blood pressure was about 90 millimeters of mercury with 100 mils of volume loading plus aramine to get the systolic blood pressure up to 110 we demonstrated severe, severe mitral regurgitation, and this patient underwent uh, valve repair. Um, the patient in the lower um, part of this slide is a patient with ischemic heart disease who was, it was felt they had severe mitral regurgitation when they were in pulmonary edema in the emergency department. Um, the TOE was pretty um, unremarkable in terms of the mitral valve until we performed a dobutamine stress echo where you can see the shape and morphology of the annulus changed and the patient developed severe mitral regurgitation. So we can use all of these modalities to assess uh, our mitral regurgitation when severe and acute. But in terms of stepping outside echocardiography, there's really only one indication and that would be coronary angiography in the evaluation of secondary mitral regurgitation. And this is taken from the 2012 guidelines. Okay, a acute aortic regurgitation, the second of the valve lesions that I'm going to discuss. Um, clinically, it can be very challenging because when a patient has very catastrophic aortic regurgitation, um, the peripheral signs are attenuated, so they lose their high volume pulse. Um, and this correlates very well with a poor clinical status. So less evident um, features clinically correlate with a patient that's sicker. And all of you know the standard echocardiographic features, but, but again, I would signal uh, caution when a regurgitation is very, very severe. So this is the patient that you saw earlier that was on extracorporeal support with a severe MR. Um, he had undergone a transcatheter aortic valve implant. He went into ventricular fibrillation during the implantation um, and was put on uh, VA ECMO. He was delivered back to the intensive care unit where he developed catastrophic pulmonary edema. And this ventricle, we felt, was much more active than it had been previously. And despite there being no color uh, Doppler signal, it was felt that this patient has severe aortic regurgitation. And you can see from the angio performed in the cath lab about 20 minutes later, that was indeed the case. So when the regurgitation is very, very severe, 
and you have equalization or near equalization of pressures, be careful when you're using color Doppler. The role of echocardiography in terms of then what one does to inform the surgeon is extremely well defined. And with increasing aortic uh, valve repair, we're being asked to be much more sophisticated in the way we approach these valves. However, in patients with severe um, acute aortic regurgitation, for the most part, the patient will undergo uh, aortic valve replacement, except for in the presence of aortic dissection, when the surgeon may elect to resuspend the valve if it is structurally fairly normal. In terms of multimodality imaging, so stepping outside plain chest radiograph and outside the modalities within echocardiography, with the onset of transcatheter aortic valve implantation, we've become very used to using these imaging modalities in the complementary way. So once the diagnosis, for example, of severe aortic stenosis is made, we would expect to use multimodality imaging to determine how the patient would be managed, uh, the access routes, the size of the valve, um, whether they were appropriate for transcatheter aortic valve implant and indeed which type of valve. And some of the um, other non-echocardiographic uh, modalities are superior to echocardiography in determining this risk stratification. In terms of acute aortic regurgitation, there are other uh, multimodality imaging that is used. So the first I'm going to talk about is uh, acute AR associated with dissection. Uh, it occurs in between 41 and 76% of patients who present with a type A dissection, that is involving the ascending aorta. And from the IRAD data, CT was the initial diagnostic modality in over 60% of patients. And generally, the protocol that will be performed will be a non-contrast uh, CT to detect intramural hematoma, followed by a contrast CT to look at the extent of the dissection flap, the regions of malperfusion, and any contrast leak. And the advantage of CT imaging is it allows you to investigate the whole of the vascular tree from the thoracic inlet to the, the um, pelvis and allows planning of endovascular treatment. Um, this is an aortic di uh, dissection evaluation pathway taken from the American Heart Association guidelines. And it looks rather complex, but it really isn't so complex. So the first step is to identify your patients who are at risk of aortic dissection. The second step is to by bedside investigation, risk stratify them. So for example, a patient with uh, Marfan syndrome who presents with severe acute chest pain radiating to the back, who has a very strong positive family history, you would put him to, to the high risk. Um, the second step is to uh, perform diagnostic investigation. And for the intermediate and high risk, um, appropriate uh, judicial or expedited aortic imaging is recommended. And they do not recommend a specific imaging modality. What they recommend is that you should choose your mod modality depending on the patient and the expertise and the logistics of what is available. And they also suggest that if um, clinic high clinical suspicion exists for aortic dissection and initial imaging is negative, you should move on to perform other imaging. So here's a nice example of a CT with a level taken at the or uh, origin of the left main, which is coming off the true lumen. Here we're down uh, to the origin of the splanchnic circulation the right renal, which is coming off the true, and the left, which is compressed by hematoma. So CT imaging is useful for the, examining the whole of the vascular tree. In terms of the ESC, they provide us with a very nice um, uh, algorithm looking at diagnostic strategy depending on which the initial diagnostic test was, whether it was TTE or transesophageal echo. And what they suggest is if the TTE is positive, you should be able to proceed directly to surgery but should do a transesophageal echo before you undertake that surgery. If you have a CT um, which confirms type A, you can go straight to surgery, but you should perform a TTE to evaluate cardiac function. And similar to the AHA recommendations, if imaging is non-conclusive, one should use additional complementary imaging to make or exclude the diagnosis. In our routine practice where we are undertaking dissection repair, we use intraoperative vascular ultrasound, either direct epiaortic or direct looking at the peripheral vascular access to determine the true and false lumens and to assist the surgeons with their cannulation, and that is routine practice. And finally, I'm going to move on to uh, endocarditis. So this is the transesophageal echo image that you always wish you never see. This uh, is an echo from a 52-year-old gentleman who had undergone routine uh, aortic valve replacement and aortic uh, ascending aorta replacement for bicuspid aortic valve 
um, and dilated ascending aorta six weeks pri prior to this uh, TOE. He developed post-operative Dresler syndrome treated with uh, steroids initially, non-steroidals, and ultimately pericardiocentesis, but remained pyrexial and um, went home on antibiotics and came back uh, six weeks later in extremis, and he had a diagnosis of aspergillus endocarditis. So this is what one doesn't want to see. Um, and in particular, one has to consider uh, the roles of complementary uh, imaging in particular with respect to periannular extension. The 2009 ESC guidelines for uh, imaging in endocarditis suggested that complementary imaging such as CT, MRI, and PET have yet to be evaluated in infective endocarditis. And here's a nice example of a CT demonstrating uh, extra aortic uh, communication with a fistula in a patient with a root abscess. However, things have moved on significantly since 2009. So when one looks at the potential complementary roles of transesophageal echo uh, and CT, they both have their strengths and weaknesses. So when one looks at vegetations and perforations, actually possibly CT is superior in the demonstration of prosthetic vegetations, but pro probably inferior in demonstrating leaflet perforation. In terms of hemodynamics, echocardiography is clearly superior. But when one looks at abscess cavities and fistulae connections, uh, TOE is highly operator dependent in these complex cases, whereas CT is increasingly shown to, re to demonstrate fistulae and uh, periannular extension very reliably. Coronary artery involvement in certain si situations with transesophageal echo can be challenging. If the root is extremely large, it can be difficult. If the root is distorted because of larger abscess cavities, it can be challenging. And in the presence of a metallic aortic valve replacement, it can be very difficult sometimes to identify the right coronary artery. By contrast, uh, the role of CT angiography is emerging in assisting us with these difficult patients. And in particular, with extracardiac endocarditis, um, imaging extracardiac shunts in congenital endocarditis can be difficult. Peripheral embolization with TOE is not visualized. However, you can see very nicely the ascending aorta, in particular if the patients have previous surgery with aortic cannulation. CT scanning, by contrast, is increasingly emerging as an imaging modality which may be useful in extracardiac, and, uh, extracardiac manifestations of endocarditis. In terms of specifics, if one has prosthetic val uh, valve endocarditis, uh, M uh, MDCT is potentially superior, um, in particular uh, if there's demonstration of valve malfunction, panis and or thrombus, particularly if you have multiple valve replacements. So if you have an aortic and a mitral valve replacement, it can be particularly challenging to image the aortic valve. It's extremely good at demonstration of paraprosthetic complications and vegetations. In patients who are already scheduled for surgery, so you're planning to go to the operating room because you have severe aortic regurgitation, multi-slice CT can potentially give you the opportunity to avoid a direct, direct cannulation of the coronary arteries with potentially lethal embolization. It also potentially allows you to visualize the coronaries, uh, especially when distorted by masses and, and abscesses. It gives you good uh, assessment of perivalvular uh, extension. And you can use 3D reconstruction to, inv to involve, um, to help the surgeons in planning complex cases, but that's not so relevant in severe acute aortic regurgitation. Some would say the main strength of CT is evaluation of embolic complications, in particular uh, brain abscesses, and these are generally underreported when we rely just on CT, and is reported in an excess, I think, up to about 82% if CMR is used. And we have to remember that in cases of cerebritis, microabscesses, and microinfarcts, CT is not useful. And if we're concerned prior to undertaking surgery, concerned enough, we might want to consider MRI. What about 18FFDG PET CT? This is an interesting technique. When used in prosthetic valve endocarditis, in addition to the DUPE criteria, so a modified DUPE criteria, increases sensitivity from 70 to around 97%. In native valve endocarditis, mostly it's just used to confirm the diagnosis, and there are a few small case series suggesting that pyorexia of unknown origin with a negative TTE, you can use 18FFDG PET-CT um, to make the diagnosis. It's very good at uh, potentially identifying peripheral embolic events. So here's a patient with an interposition graft, which you can see is lighting up, but you can also see some hot spots in the thoracic spine from peripheral embolization.
although a very nice technique, it does have limitations, particularly uh, small vegetations with, with a high oscillatory frequency may be missed. You may get false positives. It's quite challenging to interpret in the context of recent surgery, and it is not a great technique for cerebral imaging. So some have suggest that we use leukocyte spect in uh, conjunction with the uh, PET-CT to improve our diagnostic uh, capability with particularly uh, prosthetic valve endocarditis. This is more uh, specific for the detection of infectious foci, but it is more time consuming. And the 18F FDG PET-CT has got better spatial resolution, hence the proposal that these two could be used together, but only small studies thus far have been performed and the jury is still out. I would highly recommend this absolutely excellent uh, review that came out in the European Heart Journal in April this year, looking at multimodality cardiac imaging in endocarditis. It's a really excellent review. My final caveat relates to the patient, because in theory, some of these uh, uh, techniques are fantastic. But if you have a catastrophically critically ill patient, here we have a patient on extracorporeal membrane oxygenation, undertaking a CT scan is not without risk to the patient, and it's not without uh, serious challenges to the anesthetist and intensivist that has to transport the patient uh, to the scanner and back. So one has to know that one is really going to get inf uh, information that will assist the surgeon and is vital to planning the optimal surgery, uh, surgical intervention. So I've taken you through acute valvular regurgitation, some of the challenges in terms of diagnosis, acute mitral regurgitation, looking at multimodality imaging, and the sort of broader potential application in acute aortic regurgitation. And my key messages still stand. This is a potentially lethal disease, potentially rapidly lethal. We do use multimodality imaging, but some of the newer emerging techniques are really not well validated, particularly in the very sick patients. And any inappropriate delay and in transfer is always bad for these patients. Thank you very much.